right, so we've been talking about increase. Everybody say increase out of Psalms 115. And so uh, I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said we're two or three together and his name is right here. So we know you're here by the person and power of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, uh, Lord, for speaking through my lips, putting your thoughts in my mind and ministering to each person within the sound of my voice. I thank you. Your Holy Spirit is ministering. Your angels are also assisting and helping us to bring forth fruit in your kingdom. And we'll give you praise for all the fruit that is born in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed with the prayer said, Amen. Amen. Psalms 115 is where we're starting. 115, beginning in verse 11, it says, You that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Have you got any help? Well, if you trust in the Lord, he is their help and he is their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Aaron, or house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. He'll bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. So God's got a plan of increase for you in every area of your life. He wants your relationship with him to be stronger. Uh, get more efficient and getting your prayers answered and, and walking with the Lord, have more peace, more joy in your life, marriage to get better, the relationship in your family to get better, everything in your life to get better. God's for increase. Second uh, Peter 3.18 says it this way, grow in grace and undeserved favor, spiritual strength. Well, if you're growing in something, that means you're getting, you're increasing, right? spiritual strength and recognition and knowledge and understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, we need more knowledge and understanding of Jesus, don't we? So we need to grow in that. And then 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says this, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. So we should be increasing in our love walk. And it's not talking about some feeling. It's talking about what God says love is. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8, love is patient and kind and doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It has all these attributes about love, and he says we're supposed to increase in love. So God wants, God has increased for us in our life in every, in every uh, area. He created a beautiful, meaningful life for us to live, and we have an example of it in the Old Testament. It was called Canaan's land. And uh, <clears throat> they used to think, that Canaan's land was a picture of heaven, but it couldn't be because there were giants and enemies in the land that they had to dispossess and fight. And there's no fighting when you get to heaven. The last battle will be over. So Canaan's land is a picture of really what belongs to us as believers. And you can read about it in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, Deuteronomy 8, Numbers chapter 13. You can see that it's a land, the Bible says, that the eyes of the Lord never depart from that land. In other words, he's looking at this. It's beautiful. It describes it as a land of, of milk and honey and rivers and valleys and, and abundance of every kind. And it's just, it was a wonderful land and it's what God had for his people. Uh, that was his will for them. He brought them out of slavery, out of Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. This is all a picture of really what belongs to us as believers. So they came out of the world. They went through the Red Sea, a type of water baptism. They had to go through the wilderness. And then, then they, they, God's plan was for them to get over into this land called Canaan and live there. And it's a picture of our inheritance. It was something God gave to them. But as believers, that's a picture for us that God has a great land for us. He's got a great life planned for you. He's got a great life plan for your children and for generations. So the whole world and the people around you can say, man, why is your life so much different? I mean, wh what is it about you guys? And you can say, well, it's our God. We're living, we're living under his divine protection and his plan. It's not because we're the sharpest knife in the drawer. But we have a God who cares about us. In Genesis 17, we can see this clearly, what God said to Abraham and his descendants Beginning in verse 4, he says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you 
and I will give. First thing God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you, but it's an everlasting covenant and it's perpetual. It goes from you to your descendants and your seed after you in their generations. This is an everlasting covenant. And the first thing he says, I'm going to give to you all the land of Canaan wherein you dwell. He said, I got this place called Canaan for you. Well, it's a, a land of abundance. Well, we don't live in that part of the world. It's not talking about a physical location for us. It's talking, this is a picture, an allegory that we can look at and say, man, God's got a great life plan for me. God's got something I can enjoy. And then, and then it'll be transferred to my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And this, this, this life that has God a God-centered life, a God-blessed life with peace and joy and where the presence of God is there in my family forever. That, that is my land of Canaan and that's your land of Canaan. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, it was to Abraham and his seed. And if you don't know, Galatians 3.29 says, if you belong to Christ, how many of you belong to Christ? Amen. Then are you, whose seed are you? Whose seed are you? And you're an heir according to the promise made to Abraham. So I'm Abraham's seed. So I have a land of Canaan. <clears throat> and he said, I'll be a God to you. So I have a God. Everybody say, I have a God. If you belong to Christ, I have a God. My God's the biggest, baddest God there is. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. And he created the universe and everything that's here. And there's nothing impossible with my God. And we, we need to learn to walk in relationship with him and, a, and, and enjoy our covenant and the benefits of it and the great things that God has for us in our life. Now, all of this was a picture of what belongs to us. We found out in 1 Corinthians 10 that it talks about how some people got in this land of abundance. It belonged to all of them, but all of them didn't get to go there. Some of them died in the wilderness before they got over to this land of Canaan. And you can see the same thing with Christians today. A lot of them, I mean, they get out of the world. They accept Jesus. They're born again. They never get into the land of Canaan. They die in the wilderness. Well, how come? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, it says all the things that happened to them were written as an example for us. So I want to I live in the land of Canaan, and I want you to be there. I want you to enjoy God's best in your life so everybody that knows you and knows your family and knows your life will say, wow, I mean, God has really done something for them. So, so we found out their enemies, they get in there. I mean, it didn't just fall on their head. They had to fight some giants. They had to take down some walled cities. So what are the enemies we're going to face? You know, the Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Well, I mean, there's no reason to fight if there's not any enemies. And faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So there's some enemies that we have to deal with in life. I wish we didn't. I wish we got saved and put in a Hallmark card and everything was just wonderful. But that's not true. There's going to be enemies. We live on enemy territory down here. There's a God of this world and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. And he'll destroy your life and he'll bring tests against you and trials against you. He'll bring enemies against you to keep you out of that land. Are you here? So today we're going to be talking about, I guess, enemies to increase. And I'm just going to give you three things that will help you. <clears throat> every single person in here, every single person watching or listening to this, you have to deal with these three things. Everybody. I mean, when you're old, by the time you get old enough to do anything till your last breath on earth, you'll be dealing with these enemies to, to your inheritance and to enemies to increase. <clears throat> so number one is this, distractions. Everybody say distractions. Man, what a, what a world we live in. So easy to be distracted. So easy to get your mind on something else. Get busy doing something else and, and forget the thing that God has called you to do and the thing that should be the most important in your life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Amplified. I love the scripture. It says, for we are God's workmanship, God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew. How many of you have been born anew? That's the same terminology Jesus used in John 3 where he said you must be born again. That's talking about a change on the inside. Born anew, it says, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them living the good life. What kind of life? Huh? What kind of life? That sounds like, that sounds like Canaan's land, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. God's got a good life prepared for you. 
He has a hope and a future prepared for you, something good. He's a good God. You want good for your kids. God's got good for you. You know, Psalms 139, verse 16. I like this. This is a New Living Translation. It says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You know, God, God knew you, you, your life's not an accident. You didn't get here by accident. You know, one of the great disservices we do to all of the, all of the people, uh, all of our young people growing up, we tell them there's no God. You weren't created for any purpose. You're just an accident. You're just a little higher on the evolutionary chain. Nobody created you. Nobody cares about your life. Nobody has a plan for you. Yeah, I mean, you're just like a monkey. You're just a little bit higher up on the chain. And we, we feed that garbage into their brain from the time they're little bitty to the time they get out of the university. And then most of them don't even believe in God anymore. Think their parents are a bunch of Neanderthals. And we wonder why. What happened? I raised her in church. I don't understand this. Yeah, you had her in church a little bit. Then you sent her off to the university and they brainwashed her and told her there's no God and America's bad and socialism's great and communism is wonderful. Yeah. And we wonder, what happened to our kids? Y'all quit shouting and sit down out there. <laughs> Are you here today? God's got a plan for your life. And you weren't an accident. He knew all about it before you were ever born. He had a plan for every day of your life. You, you could say it this way. God's the author of your life story. He wrote it all down. The problem is you're the editor. You're the editor. And a lot of people are deleting certain chapters of their life. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. And, and they miss this chapter and they miss this thing God had prepared for them and they skip over that and they took their life a different way because they're the editor of their life. They got a free choice. Baby, you got a free choice. Are you here? But God, he, he created you. He loves you. He's got a plan for your life and it don't matter. Maybe your mama wasn't planning on you. You know, we support James Robinson's ministry here. One of the reasons and the area we like to support is where they drill water wells in these different countries and help these kids and feed them that are so needy. So we send them money every month to help with those projects. And, uh, but you know, James, if you've ever heard his testimony, his mother was raped. He never even knew who his dad was. He was a product of rape, product of sin. I mean, how horrible... And so he comes into the world and you would say, well, nobody planned on you. Nobody cared about you. But you know what? His life has changed millions of lives because his mama might not have been planning on him, but God Almighty was planning on him. Are you here? And you say, well, this happened to me and that happened to me and that happened. Well, let me just tell you something. God loves you the way you are. He don't care about your past. He's wrote a wonderful story for your life. And if you'll follow him... If you'll say, God, I, I want your plan. I want your purpose. And you don't get distracted from, from God. You can find it. But people get distracted very easy. And the story that God wrote out for them, they miss it. Because God wanted them to have a beautiful marriage, but, but something got in the way. The golf game got in the way. The secretary at work got in the way. The building a business got in the way. Other things got in the way of what God's story was. And they got distracted. You know, it was a crazy, I mean, you can look this up. I mean, crazy thing happened in the 2004 Summer Olympics with uh, an American, Matthew Emmons was his name, and tremendous markman, and he was, he was uh, going for the gold medal in marksmanship. So he's going for the gold medal and he was way ahead. And, you know, they have a series of shots that they have to make. So he gets to the last shot, and he didn't even have to hit a bullseye. They just said if he hit anywhere close to the target, he automatically won. He was so far ahead. So he gets up to shoot, and he shot, and he hit a bullseye. The problem was he hit a bullseye on somebody else's target. And instead of getting a gold medal, he ends up getting eighth place. 
And I thought, you know, that's a whole lot like a lot of Christians. I mean, they hit a bullseye. I mean, they got that done. They accomplished that. I mean, they figured out how to make the, you know, the, the, the fire ants live 25 years and be oblivious to everything. They devoted their life to that. Or the brown beetle from Boston, and they got that done. I mean, they found all, about, all out about chimpanzees. But is that what God had for them? They hit a target. I got that business built. I got that done. I mean, he who dies with the most toys wins. Man, I got toys everywhere. Really? Is that the target that God had for you in your life? Is that what you were supposed to be hitting at? But so many times we get distracted and we're doing this and doing that and, and we miss the story that God wrote for our life, an amazing story. Proverbs 4, verse 25 through 27 in the Message Bible, I like this. It says, keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all sideshow distractions. Watch your step and the road will stretch out smooth before you. Look neither right nor left. Leave evil in the dust. He says, ignore these sideshow distractions. Well, this happened. I can't, you know, this has got me doing that and our business is doing that and we, we you know, they've got all these COVID lockdowns and blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of distractions in the world that can eat up your time and you're, you're busy running over here and running over there. I mean, we had a dog one time that, I mean, that dog was okay, the dog was nice, except one thing, if, you, if there was a ball to be seen anywhere, the dog was immediately obsessed with the ball. It's like some dogs, you know, you'll be petting the dog and all of a sudden the dog sees a squirrel. Squirrel, boom, the dog's gone. And there's a lot of people that are like that in their life. They're chasing this and they're running there. And instead of living a purposeful life, accomplishing what God wants them to do and staying on track, they get distracted and they're running here and they're running there and they're doing this and they're doing that. And the whole thing is, well, what about God? What about his plan? What about the story he wrote for you to live? You know, you, you still have to have God as the center of your life. You're not going to get in Canaan's land. You're not going to have God's best if you don't give God your best. Are you here? I mean, what do, what do you, what, the scripture says from the Old Testament in Exodus where it gave us the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm number one. Jesus said, seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that Gentiles are seeking. They're seeking money. They're seeking houses. They're seeking clothes. They're seeking food. They're seeking provision. They're seeking all these other things. Jesus said, you put God first. You keep that right. Don't get distracted off the, you got to keep the main thing, the main thing. Are you here? What, what are you doing? You know, Jesus said in Mark's gospel, he said that in, in Mark chapter 13, verse 34, that he was, like a, he was like a man that went on a journey and went into a far journey and he gave authority to his servants. And notice, to every man, to every woman, to every person, his work. Everybody say his work. His work. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be a preacher. Everybody's going to be doing this, doing that. Very few are called into the fivefold ministry, but everybody's called to help and to be a light and to assist. Everybody's got to work. What are you doing? I mean, what, if, you're, if, you're, if you're pouring concrete, while you're there, you're on assignment for God. What about his work? What about his influence? What about letting your light shine with the men you're working with? What about letting your light shine at the office? If you're at school or if you're a doctor or a lawyer or if you're a home builder <clears throat> or you work in any type of job anywhere, you're supposed to be remembering, I'm a secret agent for Jesus. And I'm not so secret. I'm on a secret assignment here and I'm going to let my light shine and I'm going to let people see a difference in me. People are going to say, who does they act like? Is it Mohammed? No. Oh, they must be Christians. They act like Christ. Because you're, you're working. You're, you're remembering your main purpose of 
keeping God the center of your life and, and making him known to the people around you? What is your purpose? If you don't find out what in the world you're supposed to be doing here, you're never going to get into the land of Canaan. You got to focus. You got to, you got to stay concentrating on his work. <clears throat> Can I get an amen? amen? Don't be distracted. And there's temptations for all of us to do that, to give up, say, well, I've been doing that. I mean, I'm just fooey on that. Here's what I'm going to do. This is what I want to do. Don't get distracted. The second thing that every single person has to deal with is desires of the flesh. Everybody's got a flesh, and none of it's good. The Apostle Paul said, in my flesh is no good thing. And you can see from the time kids are little bitty. I mean, they got desires of the flesh, and they got self-will, and they don't care if you like it or not. You know, we've got two, uh, two grandkids now that are three years old. They just turned three. Little boy, little girl, they're three. And uh, so we're, we're together at Christmas time. And, you know, so generally I pray for the meal at Christmas. So I'm getting ready to pray for the meal at Christmas. And the little boy says, no, I want to pray. And the little girl said, no, I'm going to pray. And so they both started praying as fast as they could. They're just praying over the food. Just blessing. No, I'm praying. And they're just, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And I did think it was funny, but... They pray for each kind of food on the plate. Bless this macaroni, bless the macaroni, bless the chicken, bless. I mean, they're going, just going to town. But there's, there's self. Everybody wants, you want what you want. Don't you want what you want? How many of you want what you want? Oh, we've got one honest person and a bunch of liars. <laughs> yeah, you want what you want. I want what I want. You want what you want. But you've got to learn to deal with the flesh. You know, over in Acts chapter 7, very interesting, most people, when they think about Moses, they don't even know this is in the Bible. They don't even know. In Acts chapter 7, interesting, it says, talking about Moses, when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up. Remember, put him in a basket, he flo flows down the river, Pharaoh's daughter gets Moses. Takes him out, raises him in Pharaoh's house. He was raised as Pharaoh's grandson in the palace. Amazing. So he's there. He's, he's got everything the world has to offer. And it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and notice, was mighty in words and in deeds. What? He was mighty in words and in deeds, Moses was. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Somehow God started dealing with him about the fact that he, he was actually a Hebrew. And so he went down to see what was happening to the Hebrews, comes out of the palace, he sees these slaves, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Now listen, for he supposed, everybody say supposed. He supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. What? I mean, that's not the way I thought it was. I thought it was like Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. How many of you have seen that movie, Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments? All right, so, so I grew up and I thought that really Moses was just, a, he just had some noble character and he was out there one day and he saw, he saw the, the Egyptian being cruel to, uh, you know, one of the Hebrews and he butted in and got in a fight and he killed the guy. And just because he was noble, but that's not true. It says he, he supposed that they knew he was supposed to be the deliverer. And he thought, when I step up and I start doing this, everybody's going to say, yay, Moses, he's our deliverer. Let's follow Moses. He supposed they knew he was supposed to be the deliverer. After all, he was mighty in word and in deed. But guess what? That didn't happen. And he ends up having to flee for his life. And he goes out and he lives on the backside of the desert for 40 years. And while he's on the backside of the desert, you know what's going on? The flesh is getting burned up. All of this stuff about I'm mighty in word and I'm mighty in deed started getting melted out of Moses. 
all of this self-will that, we, that comes into us and that comes from the fall and from sin and is in our flesh that we all have to deal with, it starts getting melted out a little bit by a little bit, a little bit. And 40 years later then, God appears in a burning bush. And Moses goes up there and his whole, everything is changed. And Moses has what I would call a final exam. And God is saying, all right, Moses, I know you used to be, you said you were mighty in word and deed and you were going to lead them out because of your great skill. They said he was a general, if you study. One of the generals of Egypt. So I got a little test for you. I want to see if you're going to do it your way or my way. And Moses' whole attitude was different. He said, I, I, I can't go. I, I can't talk. I, I can't talk. Please send somebody else. Just send somebody else. God said, I, I'm with you, Moses. I'm with you. I'm going to help you do this. And then God gave him his final exam. You know what it was? He said, throw that, throw that staff you have in your hand. Throw that stick down on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. And he was, you know, apparently was a poisonous viper. And Moses ran from it. And God told him, Moses, go pick that Go pick that serpent up by the tail. Now, anybody who knows anything about snakes, you don't pick a snake up by the tail, do you? Don't you pick it up behind the head? Because if you pick it up by the tail, it can just whip right around and bite you. So Moses basically was saying, if you tell me to do it, I don't care what it looks like. I'm going to just do whatever you say to do. And so he goes over and he picks it up by the tail. And as soon as he picked it up, it turned into, back into the staff. And he was saying, I'm just going to do it your way. I've been out here for 40 years. You know what's interesting? God had told Abraham, he said, your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But you know they weren't? They weren't. You know how long they were slaves in Egypt? 430 years. So if you subtract the 40 years that Moses was in the wilderness, in the desert from the 430 years, that means at the 390th year, Moses decided, I'm going to lead him out, but he was going to do it his way, and he screwed everything up. And him being 10 years too early caused the children of Israel to have to be slaves for another 30 years. So if you want to get in the land of Canaan, if you want to have God's best, you've got to learn it's not yourself you're depending on. You have to learn to deal with this. And every single human has to deal with this stuff. And it may be a habit. It may be a sin. It may be an attitude. But we all got to deal with this self. We all got to deal with this desires of the flesh. You know, there's a, there's a story, really, that's a picture in the Bible that I really like about uh, Jacob. And uh, Jacob, if you remember, he was, he was the one who stole his brother's inheritance. And so Esau was his brother. Esau was a hunter and, uh, you know, kind of a man's man. And Jacob wasn't. He stayed around with the flocks. His mother was, he was the pet of his mother and so on and so forth. But he stole his brother's inheritance. And then he had to flee from his brother. Well, so here you fast forward years later, uh, Jacob is having a crisis. Here is his midlife crisis. And the midlife crisis is this. He finds out that Jacob, I mean, that Esau knows where he's at. And Esau has an army. And Esau is coming to him. And so Jacob, he gets his wife and his kids. And he, he gets some of his servants. And he says, go hide them. Start running. Get out of here. I'm going to stay here with some men. And I'm going to face Esau. So he's waiting for Esau to get there. This is a crisis point in his life. And while he's there, all of a sudden, something happens because this is a picture of us wrestling with God. And it says this, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. You find out, if you keep reading, that this was an angel that came. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint. God, God can deal with your flesh. Then he said, let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing upon me. <clears throat> the man asked, listen to this, 
what is your name? And in shock of realization, whispering, he said, Jacob, supplanter, schemer, trickster, and swindler. So all of a sudden, there's a realization to Jacob how he's lived his life. And he, he whispers when the man says, what is your name? All of a sudden, it dawns on him, this is who I am. This is how I've lived my life. This is what I've been. I've been a swindler. I've been a cheat. That's what I've done. And he whispers and says, my name's Jacob. It goes on to say that the man ends up blessing him and that this is a picture. He changes his name from Jacob to Israel, Prince of God, somebody who contended with God and won. And it's showing that we all have this wrestling and sometimes we wrestle. There's stuff we wrestle with. You ever wrestled with anything? You ever wrestled with thing? Maybe you wrestled with worry. Maybe you wrestled with this and nobody knows you're wrestling with it. Maybe it's this attitude. Maybe it's this anger. Maybe it's this. And you wrestle with it. Well, God, God wants you to win. And he doesn't, he doesn't expect you to be able to do it in your own strength. He'll help you do it. All of us go through this. Jesus talked about it. He said it in a different way in John chapter 15. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. Here's Jesus. He said, I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, and takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I've given you, the teachings I've discussed with you. So he says, you're pruned by the word which I've spoken to you. And so every disciple of Jesus goes through pruning, and there's dead things that, that he cuts off. And he does it by his word. That's why you need to be in the Word. That's why you need to hear the Word of God taught and preached because it starts cutting off bad attitudes. And you, you, God's saying, you need to cut that off. You need to, you, you read that. That's not, you're not walking in love. You, you, need, to, you need to make this adjustment. You, you've got your priorities wrong. You're doing this and all of this bad junk, he starts cutting off so we can bring forth fruit. When you bring forth fruit, you're increasing. Right? And he, he wants us all to increase. And so we all go through this wrestling. We all go through this process. And I'm, I'm not telling you that it's easy, but I'm telling you, you can win, especially if you tag team and let God come in and help you. One of the things that helped me more than anything else, I, I'm just going to show you. In Romans chapter 8, this passage of Scripture, just for years I've been saying this, but this is amazing. If you have a habit, listen to me. If you have a habit that you haven't been able to stop, if you have a sin that you haven't been able to get out of your life. If you, have, if you have this going on, you know that it's not pleasing to God. It's not fruit from the kingdom of God, and you want, you want to break it. Listen to this. Listen. It says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's two laws in the world. There's a law of sin and death. There's a law of the Spirit of life in Christ. Sin and death wants to dominate you and keep you out of God's Canaan's land. He wants to keep you from God's best. But through Jesus Christ, we're not under that law. We're under the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Notice what it says, God has done. Everybody say, God has done. So God did something to help you with this. He did what the law couldn't do. He gave them instructions and said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. All of this stuff is death. But they couldn't keep it. And it says, because of the flesh. It was weak because of the flesh. People's flesh couldn't do that stuff. The nature of man without the Holy Spirit. But God sent his own son in the guise or the disguise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. And God condemned sin in the flesh. What did God do? God did something. He condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued it. He overcame it. He deprived it of its power. What did he do? Back up to, to the end of verse 2 again. What did he do? God condemned sin in the flesh, subdued. Everybody say subdued. Overcame and deprived it of its power, deprived it of its power over all who accept that sacrifice. So I'm asking you, have you accepted the sacrifice of Christ? Do you believe that happened? Well, three or four of you. I said, have you accepted the sacrifice of Christ? 
Well, the Bible says sin has been deprived of its power over you. And somebody said, well, I know Christians. They sin. Well, I know because they don't know that or they don't know how to take advantage of that. Jesus died for everybody in the world, but it won't do you any good unless you put faith in Jesus. That won't do you any good unless you learn to take advantage of it. So every day, I say this, according to the Word of God, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and I believe God's Word, and according to the Word of God, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For God's done what the law couldn't do as weak through the flesh, but God sent His own Son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, and God has subdued and overcame sin in the flesh. I'm free from sin. I've accepted the sacrifice of Christ. Sin, you have no power over me. And then I'm believing and I'm taking advantage of what belongs to me and that's what I tell my body. I'm not a slave to sin. I'm free from sin. Sin has no power over me. God did something about it. I'm a slave of righteousness. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And when you start doing that then, all of a sudden, you're, you're cutting this stuff off. And I mean, you're, you're cooperating with God and you can break these habits and things you've been struggling with for years. But you need to write it down. You need to start saying it. It's not going to happen until you believe it and you start living and speaking in agreement with it. And you start saying, sin has no power over me. I've, I've accepted the sacrifice of Christ. And you can, you can stop the desires of the flesh from rewriting your story and changing it from what God wanted you to have. Can I get an amen? The last thing is this. Everybody faces it. Everybody does. And especially, I would say, this last year has been terrible for a lot of people. And the last thing is this, discouragement. And everybody faces discouragement. There's going to be tests, there's going to be trials, and it's easy to get discouraged and you think, man, I wanted to do this, this was going on. Next thing you know, you know, I can't even go to work here. Somebody had this, I'm quarantined. I know, I know people have been quarantined for three different times. Three different times, I mean, everything gets screwed up. This happened, that happened, all this stuff going on. And it's discouraging. Well, I mean, I was expecting this to happen and that, and you have all of this stuff, but the Bible says that we can't give in to discouragement. In Romans chapter 4, you have the father of faith, Abraham, and he came through what the Bible says was hopeless. And it's telling us that we have to follow his type of faith. And it says, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only, which is of the law or Abraham's descendants who were actually, uh, you know, his descendants after the flesh, but to that also, which is a faith through faith were Abraham's descendants. Who is the father of us all? As it is written, I made you a father of many nations before him, whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. Notice what it says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now here you have Abraham, and it says he, he was in a situation that was hopeless. In fact, the Message Bible says, when everything was hopeless, everybody say hopeless. Abraham believed anyway. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. Here he is, here he is, 100 years, and he just decided, I'm going to believe anything. It may look hopeless. It may look like, the, the, you know, I can't have the marriage God wants me to have. We're just too different. I, my children, this has happened to them. That's went on. That's went on. It looks hopeless. My business is never going to recover. This is going to happen. Well, I know, but it says when everything was hopeless, he just believed anyway. He just believed anyway. I mean, you, you're always believing something. You might as well believe what God said. And you're going to face times when it, it just looks so discouraging. But what are you supposed to do? Well, Psalms 42, 11 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Who, who are you supposed to be looking to? It's supposed to be God. 
There, there's going to be circumstances in your soul, as your mind, will, and emotions. Why are you cast down? Why are you, why are you so discouraged? It says you need to be looking to God. You need to get your hope and your confidence in your God and not your circumstances and not your ability, not you being mighty in word and deed, but your eyes need to be on the Lord. You know, Psalms 5, 11, and 12, one of my favorite passages. Here's the Amplified Bible. Let all those who take refuge and put their trust in you, what are they supposed to do? Rejoice. Let them ever sing and shout for joy because you make a covering over them and you defend them. Let them also that love your name be joyful in you and be in high spirits. Why in the world should you be in high spirits? I read that, some, I read that basically every day. And I'll say, why should I be in high spirits? Oh, yeah, for you, Lord, will bless the righteous, him who's upright and in right standing with you. As with a shield, you'll surround him with goodwill, pleasure, and favor. So I'm in high spirits because God, God is my shield. God's my refuge. God's my fortress. Who are you looking at? Who are you depending upon? You got to get your eyes and your attention upon God. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? And sometimes we're not getting the increase because we're looking at circumstances and we're all discouraged and upset and perplexed and worried and fearful instead of trusting God. Psalm 67, 5 through 6 says, Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. What have we been talking about? Increase. Everybody say increase. <clears throat> when does increase come? When we're griping and complaining? When we're worrying and being fretful and saying, I don't know what we're going to do. It looks hopeless to me. No. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, will bless us. He wants you to get your attention on Him, not being all upset about <clears throat> what's happened or what you lost. You got to forget about that and say, I'm trusting God. You know, Jesus said that the way we're supposed to come into the kingdom of God, you know what He said about it? He said, you're supposed to come into the kingdom of God like a little child. He didn't say, uh, children can't be saved. You know, they had a big deal about this many years ago. There were, there were some denominations that didn't even think kids could be saved. But yeah, kids can be saved. Jesus said, you don't get in the kingdom of heaven unless you come like a little child. And you know one thing about little children? Little children are trusting. And you know what? They just, they just trust their father. They, just, they have confidence in him. He's going to take care of them. They don't get up and worry and fret. You know, we've got, like I said, two, three-year-olds now. And we have a pool at our house that's got a slide, and neither one of them can swim yet. They're working with them, so on and so forth. But where the slide empties out, it's, it's over their head. So, I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. They were drowned. But they, we help them get up on the slide, you know. And what's amazing to me, they'll just be giggling and happy, slide down. They have all the confidence in the world. Their father's going to catch them. Well, Jesus said, we're supposed to be like little children. Do you have confidence your father's going to catch you? Or are you all of a sudden so intellectual you've got it all figured out and you don't trust God anymore? You know, <clears throat> we watch... Uh, America's Funny Video sometimes. I like watching that. And uh, so I noticed here, it's been some time back, there was a little girl. She was probably three years old or something. And, and so she was there on the stairs. This house had stairs. And she was up several stairs. And her daddy was down here. And she was just giggling and just jumping off of the stairs. She had all the confidence in the world. Her daddy was going to catch her. Never gave it a thought. Something that could have been ended in disaster, she thought. My dad's there. My dad's going to take care of me. And God wants you to have that same attitude. He wants you to know that there's a heavenly father and that you can trust him more than, more than any natural child can trust their daddy because something can happen to daddy. But with God, all things are possible. With God, his power is immeasurable and unlimited. He just wants you to get your eyes on him and say, Lord, I, I'm trusting you what you said in your word. You have never failed. You cannot fail. You cannot lie. And I'm trusting in you and my confidence is in you and I just rejoice. And I may not know how this is going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. I may not know when everything's going to turn around, but I know it'll turn around. I know that you're with me and you're for me 
And if God be for me, who can be against me? And that's an attitude that God wants us to have. Just I'm trusting my Father, and He's going to catch me. He's going to catch me. He's right there, and He will not let me fall. And if you'll keep your eyes on Him, I tell you what, He'll just take you to the next level. He'll get you into that land of increase and abundance and plenty if you'll get your eyes on Him. Amen? Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, be sure to share it with your friends and family and hit subscribe. For more information, head over to our website or click the link below.